Good evening and welcome. Um, as I said earlier, Father John is not going to be able to join us tonight. He has a very important meeting that he has to attend to. And so he gave me the job to um, facilitate tonight. So um, some of you asked, what is the topic for tonight? So I want to um, stop the secrecy and let you know. Uh, as those of you who were here last week, you heard from Ravi, whose faith as a member of the Sikh religion prompts him to feed the hungry. Now, we don't have to go all the way to Hawaii for that. Hunger is very real in our own backyard. So tonight, we'll look at hunger in our own area and how our faith motivates us to respond. The folks who will share with you tonight will be Rita Mitchell. She's a retired nutritionist from Cal Berkeley and an active participant in our faith community. We'll also hear from Mary Churchison from our outreach committee and Mark Gundacker from our parish finance council, who uh, in addition to serving on the finance council, he serves on the board of the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano County. Before we get started, let's just pause for a moment and remember in the holy presence of God. Sharing the loaves and fishes, you gave us an image of solidarity with the hungry, O oh Lord. Sharing yourself in the bread and wine, you called all to the table, O oh Lord. Give us the hunger to be a part of the feeding and the healing of this world. Nourish us with your grace so we may work with joy to serve your children. Open our eyes and our hearts to recognize those in poverty and increase our awareness of the structures and systems that need to be changed so we may all break bread together. In your name, we pray for the end of hunger. We also tonight remember our firefighters during these very challenging times. They are bravely facing the flames and trying to put those fires out. We pray for their safety and the safety of all our medical professionals as well during this pandemic time. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. And so now I'll give the mic over to Rita. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is to talk about hunger. And I'm going to start with world hunger and then hunger in the United States and California and then end up with hunger in Contra Costa County. And then I'm going to talk about the effects of COVID on people's hunger and food security and then why it all matters and why we should do anything about it, and then what can we do. And I'm gonna speak in very, very general terms about what we can do. And then as Christoph mentioned, Mary Turgeson is gonna talk about what, um, what St. Perpetua is doing in relation to helping relieve hunger. And then Mark is gonna talk about specifically what the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano is doing. So I'm gonna share my screen. And let's see. Okay. So starting with a pretty stark statistic here, around 9 million people, including 3 million children under five, die each year as a result of hunger. And according to a couple of hours ago, 898,000 people died of COVID in the first six months of this year, but 9 million people are going to die each year as a result of hunger. And the unfortunate thing is that most of this could be eliminated if we had the political will to end hunger. So, definitions. Hunger is a mental and physical condition that comes from not having enough food, and there can be many reasons for this. 11% of the people in the world are hungry. That's one out of every nine person um, is hungry. Malnutrition 
is the result of persistent lack of food and essential nutrients that leaves one weak, underweight, and vulnerable. Food security means having access to an adequate nutritious diet to support growth and health at all times through socially acceptable means. And this is not dumpster diving or standing in bread lines or going to the food banks or St. Vincent de Paul. This is having enough food to eat um, every day. Food insecurity though, is having limited, uncertain, and consistent access to the quality and quantity of food. And food insecurity is broken down into two levels. Low food security is reduced quality, variety, or durability, but little indication of reduced intake. So this would be having to have rice and beans maybe instead of salmon and asparagus, but there's always rice and beans. Low food secure, very low food security though, is reports of multiple indications of disrupted eating patterns or reduced intake. This is when there's no food in the refrigerator or the pantry and people have to get by. I read a quote from a little boy who said, my sister is a really good cook. She made us ketchup soup for dinner last night. That is very low food security. Now, different agencies report statistics differently. Some people talk about hunger, some people talk about food insecurity, and different agencies, sometimes the numbers are a little bit different. Some people say one in 10, one in 10 and a half, whatever, um, but it's all, hunger is just pretty sad. Excuse me, Rita, we yes? see the slide that says more definitions. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So then let's talk about hunger. How many people are hungry in the world? There's 821 million people are hungry in the world. And world hunger is often related to war or conflict, wealth disparities, political corruptions, earthquakes, or other acts of God. And this map shows where hunger exists. The blue areas are areas of very little hunger, but that doesn't mean there are not pockets of hunger in all of these places. And then the green is where there's less than 5% hungry. And then as it, the colors go from yellow to darker yellow to orange to really dark orange, hunger increases. Here's some images of people experiencing water. This one is pretty severe. Um, a child dies of malnutrition every five seconds in the world. So in the United States, more than 37 million people, including 11 million children and 7 million seniors struggle with food in the United States. So who are they? 29% of households with incomes below the poverty line, which is $26,200 for a family of four. 28% of households with children headed by single women have experienced hunger, 23% of black households and 27% of Hispanic households experience hunger. So there was a survey of low-income parents in the United States reported 62% of low-income parents worried that food would run out. Um, 59 said that the food wouldn't last and there wasn't money to buy more and Sadly, 23% said that they had to limit the size of a child's meal because there wasn't enough money for food. So what is low income? The definition, it's 200% of the federal poverty level. In 2020, the federal poverty level for a family of four was $26,200. So a family with an income of less than $52,000, $52,400 is considered low income. So it's pretty low. 
whoops, uh oh, what happened here? Okay, so here are some images of um, hunger in the United States. This is a pretty classic image from Dorothea Lang. Um, and a couple other images of hungry people. And this image shows that hunger is not always apparent. This is an image of a nurse who says, being a nurse is hard. Being hungry is much harder. So California, this was a report that was done by the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation some years ago. 4.7 million adults and 2 million children live in low-income households affected by food insecurity in California. Over half of low-income households run out of food before the end of the month. And who are these hungry people? 17% of the hungry people are 65 or 75%, 17 percent of people 65 and older are hungry, 20% of pregnant women, 31% of households with children, 40% who are unemployed or undocumented are hungry. And sadly, there are a lot of people who are eligible for food assistance but are not served. 34% of those eligible for CalFresh or SNAP or food stamps, basically, um, are not receiving the benefits. But of those receiving the benefits, 75% are households with children and 50% are working families. If 100% of all eligible individuals are served, California would receive another $2.5 billion, resulting in $4.5 billion of additional economic activity for California. So it's important that as many people as possible receive these benefits, not only because it puts food into the mouths of hungry people, but it benefits our state economically. This is a quote from 26 years ago. Um, from a report, a state of the need report. Hunger in California is a disturbing paradox. Amidst one of the largest and most productive agricultural economies in the world, an estimated 5 million people, or one in six, are poor and hungry. Now, the statement is still accurate, except for the figures. Right now, it's 6.7 million people are hungry, and one, about one in 1. 5 mil, one in 5.5 .5 million people are hungry, and that's before COVID. And we'll learn a little bit more about COVID later. And here's some images of hungry people in California. She looks so sad. Okay, so. Let's look at Contra Costa County. Um, and I had to do some digging here because I live in Alameda County. So I, um, but I found some information about Contra Costa County. 92,000 people, about 41% of adults in low income households are food insecure. And remember low income households for a family of four is $52,600. Some of the reasons that people are hungry is the high cost of living and housing in Alameda or in Contra Costa County. Low wage jobs, a lot of people are in service sector jobs, and a lot of these people have lost their jobs during COVID, and we'll see some about that later. And SNAP or food stamps and other assistance is not sufficient to meet the needs of people. <clears throat> and inadequate public transportation is an issue because we'll see in this next slide here um, who the hungry people are. 45% of the hungry people are white, 36% black, and 16% Hispanic. Now the ethnic makeup of Contra Costa County is 42% white, 10% black, so a much larger percentage of the black people are hungry. I mean you would expect that it would be 10% black, but actually it's 36% black. Hispanics are doing much better. 26% of the population 
is Hispanic, but only 16% of the Hispanic people in Contra Costa County are hungry. So that, that's an interesting figure there. Um, a lot of them are under 18, 19% six and younger. The average family receiving food assistance spends 49% of its income on rent. And the amount that is recommended not to exceed is 30% of income spent on rent. So of course there's less money for food, for medicine, for anything else. Only 38% own cars. That's why public transportation, lack of public transportation contributes to the, the problem. 51% of the hungry people receive food stamps, um, but the benefits run out halfway through the month and the people who don't receive, I mean, we need to work to get people who are eligible to receive food stamps getting them. And 31% delayed medical care or 60 or 30, 31% are delaying medical care and 52% are delaying dental care. And this is information I got from the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solani, Solano. So the food bank serves two counties. So 1.8 people in the two counties turns to the food bank every month. Um, and thank goodness the food bank is there to provide food. 62% of households that the food bank serves have seniors, children, or both. And 29% rely on the food bank for at least half of their food every month. And here are some images. And these look a whole lot less like people in developing countries, but more like people who could live next door. And in fact, these are images that I got from the food bank. So these are people who live next door. And then along came COVID and changed the whole landscape. So remember this slide here. More than 37 million people in the United States, including 11 million children, struggled with hunger in the United States. And then COVID happened. And the green bar there is pre-COVID figures. And the yellow bar is estimates of what's to be expected with COVID. And so for total people, the number of people previously was 37 million. It's projected that 54 million people are going to be food insecure with COVID. And that's an increase of 46%. For children, it's even worse. It was 11 million and it's projected to be 19 million or an increase of 73% increase. So here are some images. This is an image of cars who had lined up before dawn at the San Antonio Food Bank on April 9th. This many people waiting for food. And here's just some more images of people waiting in line for food. And actually I was this, I got this off the Alameda County webpage and I'm looking, this obviously was before COVID because None of the people are wearing masks. I just now noticed that. So this is a schematic of how food insecurity is a problem. Food insecurity are the inability to get the amount of food and the nutrients that is needed leads to malnutrition and obesity. Um, and paradoxically, obesity is associated with hunger. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of uh, the big one is that um, unhealthy food is cheap. Ramen noodles and processed food and fast food are often cheaper than some of the healthier foods. So malnutrition, even the obese people are malnourished, meaning they have, they just don't have the proper nutrients to provide healthy bodies. And then malnutrition leads to vulnerability. So these people are um, vulnerable to diet-related diseases such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and also have unfavorable outcomes to conditions like COVID. And so food insecurity, if you are food insecure and you get COVID, um, your outcomes are not gonna be as good. 
There is some good news though. Um, CalFresh are food stamp participants. The numbers have gone up, you can see there. Um, so more people are getting help buying the food, but a lot of these are people who have lost their jobs. And so I couldn't find figures as to if in fact the amount of money they had available for food really increased or not. This slide shows households with children in which children are food insecure. And you can see from 2006 to 2018, um, there was actually a decrease in most categories in kids who were food insecure. But then look what happened with COVID. The numbers jumped from 5%, 7%, whatever, up to 10%, up to 30% of households with kids in which foods, in which kids are food insecure, meaning there's just not enough food to go around. And then I found some interesting charts on the website of the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. This one shows what happens when families are behind on rent and didn't have enough food. And you can see the increases just in a four week period of time. And as we could predict, Black and Latino households have a much higher incidence of food insufficiency during the pandemic. This one shows job loss. And most job losses are in industries that pay low wages, which affects disproportionate numbers of workers who are people of color which then affects their ability to buy food, which affects their nutritional status and ability to withstand diseases like COVID. So households with kids are really, really struggling, you can see. In mid-July, half of the Medicaid adults, um, and to be eligible for Medicaid, you have to be making less than $33,000, um, reported food insecurity, and they weren't confident that they could afford the kinds of food they need for the next month. So those of us who have enough food um, should really be down on our knees thanking the Lord every day that we have enough food because so many people don't. So some COVID facts, these from the, the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano, the cost of living there is quite a bit higher than the US average, which makes it more difficult when people have to choose um, where to spend their money, their limited in income. Um, the COVID has increased food security in Contra Costa County by 58%. And the food bank is expecting to serve 40,000 more people each month because of COVID. Now, since I live in Alameda County and moved to the Alameda County Food Bank, I thought that I should tell a little bit about what's happening there. Um, the helpline calls increased by 1,000% at the beginning of the pandemic. And fourth, drive-through distribution centers have been established serving 20,000 people each week and they have started a home delivery pilot. Um, and then in July, a record of 4.7 million pounds of food were distributed. So that's some of what Alameda County is doing. And then Mark is gonna tell you more about what Contra Costa County is doing. Then this past Sunday, the New York Times Magazine devoted its whole issue to hunger. And most of it were photos by a photojournalist who traveled around the country and interviewed people and took photos and told the stories of people who were hungry because of COVID. And one of the, um, the article that, that, that accompanied the photos, one of the, the um, 
passages really struck me. It said, our treatment of hunger as an emergency rather than a symptom of systemic inequities has long informed our response to it. And as a result, government programs have been designed to alleviate peak, each peak rather than to address the factors that produce them. It's like the statement, if I feed hungry people, they call me a saint. If I ask why people are hungry, they call me a communist. The article goes on to say, hunger becoming public is the start of a struggle, but it's only the beginning of what's required for change. Which makes me think of the whole issue of systemic racism. Becoming aware of the problem and acknowledging the problem is the first step to solving it. So here are some of the figures from, or images from the article. I don't know what they're eating, but they're thankful for it. And here's people eating cheap food, which is not necessarily nutritious, but it's food and it fills their bellies. And these people have just been to a food bank. So why does all this matter? Why should we be concerned about hunger? Food insecurity and the resulting hunger can have a wide impact, serious health complications, um, especially when people facing hunger have to choose between spending money on food or medicine and medical care. Damage to a child's ability to learn and grow, and we'll talk about, more about that in a second. And difficult decisions for seniors, often living on fixed income and having to choose between paying for food and critical health care. So for kids who are the future, there are a lot of consequences. Health consequences include anemia, obesity resulting from malnutrition, headaches, stomach aches, ear infections. And hunger is associated with at least 60% of all childhood deaths. Learning and academic problems result from hunger, um, poor overall achievement, more likely to repeat a grade, increased absences and suspensions, all which affect learning. And psychosocial and behavioral problems, higher levels of aggression, hyperactivity, all kinds of, of behaviors which cause problems in schools actually, um, and actually help kids along the school to prison pipeline. Um, increased need for mental health services, which aren't always available. They need the services, but the services aren't available and increased depressive and suicidal behaviors in kids. So why should we act? Let's look at what the scriptures say. Throughout Hebrew scriptures, God calls on God's people to take care of those on the margins of society. And the prophets reminded their people that the test of their faithfulness is the way they treat the poor and the vulnerable, the widows, the orphans, the foreigners, those likely to be hungry. The gospel reading today says, blessed are you who are now hungry, for you will be satisfied. And the most compelling of all, I was hungry and you gave me food. Whatever you did for the least of my people, you did for me. In 1963, St. John XXIII said, every person has the right to life, to bodily integrity, and to the means which are suitable for proper development of life. These are primarily food, clothing, shelter, rest, medical care, and finally, the right to necessary services. Catholic social teaching calls us to care for the poor and the vulnerable. And Pope Francis said, it's a cruel, unjust, and paradoxical reality that today there is food for everyone, yet not everyone has access to it. And that in some areas of the world, food is wasted, discarded, and consumed in excess, are destined for purposes other than nutrition. And so I think, you know, I reflect on this and I think, 
how often I waste food or buy too much and have to throw it out. Um, so I think there's a whole lot for us to think about. But Pope, Pope Francis goes on actually to quote his own um, encyclical Laudato C, or the Care for Our Common Home, and says, to escape from this spiral, we need to promote economic institutions and social initiatives, which can give the poor regular access to basic resources. And he encourages increased commitment to zero hunger 2030, which is a goal of the UN World Food Program. And even the UN and the Declaration of Human Rights says that all human beings have the right in have rights including food, water, sanitation, clothing, housing, medical care, and social protections. So the US Council of Catholic Bishops have had a statement and a place at the table that gives us these reasons for taking action. Our faith calls us to it. Our nation needs it. Our world requires it. Our salvation demands it. And our actions can make a difference. So what are the actions that can make a difference? First of all, we can participate in the census and encourage everybody to do so because the census determines community share of federal funds spent for schools, hospitals, feeding programs, ro roads, and, and other services. So getting an accurate count um, brings money into the communities to help with some problems. And we can vote and encourage others to vote. Hunger is political, and we can vote for candidates who support policies and programs which provide food and other essential services for families and children and seniors. We can also pray for the hungry and for an end to social and political institutions and structures which oppress the poor and make access to needed services difficult or impossible. Because there are many political institutions and structures which oppress the poor and make access difficult or impossible. So we need to attack some of those. We can get to know hungry people by volunteering at soup kitchens or emergency food pantries. Um, this is during non-COVID times. And one of the best things I've done in my, well, yeah, maybe one of the best things is to, for about 15 years, I worked at the, or volunteered at the Loaves and Fishes program at um, Berkeley, at the, the Newman Center in Berkeley, and sat down once a month with hungry people and had ate with them and had a conversation with them and learned their stories. And it was just amazing. It just sort of changed my whole perspective on hungry people and poor people. We can also give generously to organizations that feed hungry people. And in these COVID times when we're not going on vacation or going out to eat or going to the movies, it's a good time for us to think about maybe spending some of that money um, to support organizations that, that feed hungry people. Your local food bank is a great place to start. Um, and to experience temporary hunger and give the money you would have spent on food to agencies which benefit the hungry. Now, if we were live in an uncovered time, I would pass around an envelope and encourage people to think about what they would have for lunch the next day, what they would spend on lunch the next day, and forego that lunch, experience temporary hunger, and put that money in the the envelope and then I would give the money to the food bank. And actually I've done that a couple of times and have ended up with a couple of hundred bucks that I could send to the food bank. So, but we can't do that on Zoom. Also, you can participate in benefits for the hungry. Um, there's a walk to end poverty and the Great American Bake Sale. There are a number of things locally and nationally which um, which um, support the hungry. And in late May, every non-COVID year at Lake Merritt, there's a walk to end poverty. So 
getting involved in that. We can learn about hunger. Some organizations with great information about hunger, um, the California Hunger Action Coalition, Food Research and Action Council, California Food Policy Advocates, the food banks. Bread for the World is a wonderful resource. It's a Christian-based organization that is working to end world hunger um, with the lens of Christianity and what we're called to do as Christians. We can also advocate for policy and legislative change to remove barriers and improve access to federal and state programs that feed hungry people, expand funding and encourage participation in programs that help feed hungry people, support just wages so that people can buy food, and oppose cuts in public transportation. We can also become an anti-hunger advocate. There's every year in Sacramento in May, there's a Hunger Action Day um, that I participated in several times um, to educate legislators about hunger and to encourage them to support legislation which um, feeds hungry people. Also Catholic Lobby Day in Sacramento every year is a good place. And then speaking out at boards of education and city council meetings and local community meetings. So what I'm gonna do now is share a website that is fascinating. Stop the Hunger, it's an, a live website that tells how many people, current total population in the world, the number of undernourished people in the world right now, 845 million, 841 thousand and 59 people. Um, and then the number of people who died in hunger today and the number of people who died in hunger this year. Now I saw this this afternoon and because the first slide said that 9 million people died of hunger and I went back and looked that up and several places reported 9 million people dying of hunger every year. Um, but this now says 7,700 or 7.7 .7 million people um, have died this year. So I'm not sure if that's increased because of COVID. I'm not sure how the, why, why that figure is 7 million and the other figure is 9 million. But this is, it's just an interesting website. And then it goes on to talk about money spent due to obesity related causes or whatever. So um, it's just pretty astounding to see what happens, the amount of food wasted in America, 107,000 pounds of food wasted. Um, you know, we're not, we're not seeing the website. Oh, you're not? We're still seeing your last slide. Oh, oh, oh. Um, well, I'm not, sh oh, well, let me stop sharing and then start sharing again and see if that works. Oh. Um, I don't know. Okay, well. Why don't you put it, if you can, okay. uh, maybe when um, Mary's speaking, you could put it in the chat? Yes, oh, I can do that. Yeah, it's just called stopthehunger.com. Um, and it's an amazing website just to see live how the numbers change. Um, so anyway, okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mary, who's going to talk about what St. Perpetua is doing about hunger. So let me, okay. All right. So take it away, Mary. Unmute yourself. There, I go. 
with an unmute. Can you hear me now? That's good. You're all muted, so you don't know. Anyway, welcome. And um, I have um, the privilege to follow Rita, who has done all the fact-finding side of it. And I'm going to share with you what we at St. Perpetua have done um, related to the agencies that we, that we, when I say we, it's all of us, you who have been so very uh, generous with your donations. Uh, and tonight I want to focus in on those uh, food agencies that the, that the outreach committee does support. Briefly, our mission statement is built around um, providing service, action, and financial aid to those in need. And we really focus on the basic needs of food and shelter and the family support, as well as support services like healthcare or mental health. We're, we focus on those agencies that are within Contra Costa County. Uh, we've grandfathered in uh, one in Alameda. For you, Rita, friendly manner. Um, one out of three of our agencies that we support regularly offer food within their, their normal programs. And our contributions to these agencies consist through financial donations, whether it be from a um, um, monthly collection or a fifth Sunday collection or through a, um, someone who is giving a one-time donation. But we also have, as you know, our, our monthly food drives. Um, now we're getting those started up again. And at Christmas time, we have cash for turkeys. As Rita described food insecurity, that is what we heard so often or hear so often from our agencies when they um, have, um, been, we've been in contact with them, which we've been in contact throughout. Um, since COVID had started. And since the beginning of this year, they've all uh, expounded on how the need for food and the new uh, people coming in for food has grown exponentially. As, as Rita noted that food insecurity is when they're unable to meet um, and feed the members of their household, which is just gut-wrenching to me, especially when I heard that by the middle of the month where they run out of the, half of the people or they've run out of the, um, the food uh, money. It just, it's, it's heart wrenching. Um, all of our agencies um, have indicated that they've really had to look at what, how they do go to business and their business models have changed. Um, they've, uh, for those that served hot meals, they've had to, um, to distribute and uh, to do go to go to meals, um, they cannot have the uh, come in and sit down meals anymore. This has increased their costs uh, because they didn't have supplies on to go before. Uh, they they didn't do it, um, and also that also the um, productive and cleaning supplies that they've had to accommodate um, has has increased their expenses this year. The staff is putting in multiple hours of work um, because people like me and you who might have volunteered have either stopped volunteering because we're in a higher risk uh, group or we've really reduced our numbers. Uh, and a big impact to many of these um, agencies is loss of income uh, or a lower um, income coming in uh, because they aren't able to do their major fundraising events. So I want to um, share with you a few of the agencies that you all are supporting. And these three, Loaves and Fishes of uh, Contra Costa, um, St. Vincent de Paul Food Pantry at St. Francis Assisi, and the Food Bank, which Rita has, and Mark will be talking about also. Um, these three agencies all primarily focus on food. They may have some other programs, but their primary focus is delivering and supporting um, those in need with food. Lowe's and Fishes um, is one of the few that offers uh, hot meals uh, five days a week. And during COVID, they've indicated that they've added um, weekend uh, out in East, Con East Contra Costa County. Um, they've had weekend breakfast meals. Um, they've also been distributing bags of groceries so people can take it home with them. They've experienced a 60% increase in new clients and people requesting food. 
And recently they opened a dining room in Walnut Creek in partnership with Trinity Center. Um, and Trinity Center is um, an agency that offers uh, basic um, human services and is a safety net for this homeless and the working poor in Walnut Creek. St. Vincent de Paul Food Pantry is one of two agencies that are recipients of our monthly food drive and that you have supported so generously. Um, they pretty much provide food and produce to people up and down the Monument Corridor. They're, they're located over in that area and they've doubled, they've seen a double in the amount of people coming in. And a number of these, these facts kind of tie in, not kind of, do tie in with what Rita was saying. As with the food bank, um, they've experienced a high increase in demand uh, and their food insecurity within their households that they uh, support. Um, the Hispanic and Blacks, as Rita pointed out, are really being impacted. Um, uh, over a third of their populations uh, are food insecure. Uh, the wonderful thing about food bank that I saw was they not only the amount of food that they distribute, and this is just annually prior to COVID, Mark might have some other uh, updated numbers on that, but more importantly, that they are able to provide nutritious over, over half of their food or a lot of their food is coming from fresh fruits and vegetables, which is wonderful. These two agencies, Monument Crisis Center and Meals on Wheels Diablo Region, um, have food in their programs, but they also have a number of programs that are support services. Monument Crisis is the second recipient of our food drives. And during COVID, they've started an emergency food distribution three times a week. Um, and, and they do it three hours, I think it's three hours, um, three times a week and they're assisting over 300 households or 1,200 uh, individuals with these bags of groceries. They've also been able to provide ready-to-eat groceries for homeless. Uh, and I read something, Mark, you may be able to uh, comment on it um, when, when you are, a, we give you time to speak too, um, that the um, food bank is offering some of these ready-to-eat or family packs uh, for those that um, do not have a home. And, and don't have a way to prepare meals. On Meals for Wheels, um, they primarily, of Diablo region, their main focus is for, for seniors. And since COVID, they've been delivering meals to 40% more seniors. And, and once again, that's a heartbreaking number. Their CC cafes, uh, which were um, sit down uh, meals at noontime where people could come for companionship too, um, because of regulations have been shut down. And so they are now delivering um, frozen food meals seven days a week to the seniors. And they have other programs as friendly callers as well as care management for the seniors. These three um, agencies, Shelter Inc., Bay Area Rescue Mission, and Winter Nights Family Shelter, um, most of them focus more on sheltering of people and offering along with the, offering their support services to those in need. Uh, and food is a part of their, um, their program. Shelter Inc, you might recognize from a food end of it uh, because they would hold the, uh, the shelter dinners, which would be St. Perpetua participated in monthly. Um, and since we've had our new kitchen, I don't know is that we've been able to use it yet for that program uh, since they are shut down. They have, they're doing it on a to-go basis and um, I believe they're getting restaurants to help them there. Uh, the Bay Area Rescue Mission uh, offers uh, uh, emergency services and shelters, um, and for their shelter guests, they provide um, meals as well as to the homeless in the area, they provide meals. They also have a distribution center uh, that if they're, when their collections are more than what they need, that they supply food uh, to other area agencies around the Bay Area. And Winter Nights you're probably familiar with also. Um, St. Perpetua has been a, a sponsor um, for a week of, of food and support services to this group. Um, they are in the process now of trying to figure out how they're going to be um, distributing the food and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we will be able to find a way to participate in them. You all have been, as they say, so very generous and kind and caring when it's come to supporting 
um, all of these agencies. And, and this is just a sampling of what we have done um, or our agencies that uh, are primarily is, have their food associated to them. And I can't help um, but remind you that, uh, oh, by the way, Sunday is another uh, food drive. And this one is going to Monument Crisis Center to help them with their distribution, uh, emergency distribution um, program. And it will be 12.30 to 2.30, and we've moved the drop-off location. It's outside the school office. If you're gonna be there earlier than 12.30, you can leave it outside the school office on Sunday morning, and there'll be people there who will be picking it up during the noted time. We do ask if you uh, please no glass or expired items. Um, we appreciate that it's uh, the glass, uh, if it breaks, is just very messy. And if you do bring glass, we find it, uh, we'll send it back home with you um, just because um, it's, it's not something that they can use. Uh, here's the list of the items and unsweetened cereal where they're trying to get away from the added sugar products um, and the other pieces, they, they really do appreciate all of the uh, grocery bags that we all are uh, accumulating because, oh dear, we do have the money and God bless that we have the money to be able to buy enough food to keep us, keep us going and keep us healthy. So thank you very much for your continued support. And at this time, I am going to turn it over to um, Mark. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, I appreciate um, you allowing me to come in and, and talk for just a second. I know that you're uh, uh, about ready to wrap up here, but I, I really just wanted to say thank you. Right now, I am fortunate to be able to serve as a board member of the Contra Costa Solano County Food Bank. Um, and really just wanna say thank you to all the parishioners at St. Perpetua for the support that you've given the food bank um, and many of the, 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 the programs that the food bank supports, which are many of those uh, groups, Mary, that you just mentioned. So, you know, we're, we're happy to be able to do that. Um, I did have some stats and things I was going to share with you, but uh, between Reed and Mary, you've, you've stolen a lot of my thunder, which is great. I didn't have to, I don't have to do very much, um, but I will just quickly share a couple things that, sh that I think is just kind of astounding is I didn't, you know, I I'd volunteered a couple times. The first time I actually went to the food bank was with um, one of my kids when they were in uh, faith formation and the classes had volunteered to go into the food bank and it was one of the things and I was kind of looked around and went wow this is pretty a pretty huge interesting organization um, and then a few years later uh, was able was asked to be part of the the board so started uh, just about a year ago became part of the food bank board so I'm still learning a lot about it but you know a couple things that I will repeat what you said you know we distributed 31 million pounds of food last year that was up from 25 um, from the year before, but that's going to go up even higher given COVID. You know, the last few months we've seen our monthly year over year um, increase to like 69% of what the month, the previous month was, or the, that month in the previous year was. Um, it's not, the, the need is not really going down, it's going up. Um, I think Mary mentioned about half of what the food bank distributes is produce, which is great. A lot of people think it's, you know, stuff that gets donated. Um, we get a lot of big, um, farm farmers that will donate things um, and also we buy a lot of our own food you know mo a majority of what we distribute we buy but we have relationships with farmers with organizations that allow us to buy things at um, a significantly diff lower cost so that we can can do it so that's where you know we're constantly asking for donations a lot of that goes for the food that we are able to purchase um, in a way that then we can able to turn around um, in a much more effective way to serve our communities. About one in eight residents um, in Contra Costa County actually rely on the food bank. Um, one in four emergency food, food recipients are children, I think as Rita and Mary both mentioned. Uh, one of the things that, that we're proud of is about 96 cents of every dollar that's donated um, to the food bank goes directly to our food, food bank programs uh, to really get food to the individuals. Um, and we have a warehouse, we have two warehouses really, one in, in Concord and one in Vacaville. They're open seven days a week for distribution and volunteer opportunities. We don't, um, you know, we don't, we, we did have a food pantry there, but we're really not using those for the food pantry. Our model is to go out to many of the other groups that Mary's also talked about that provide food pantries and sort of provide them their stock so that they can come to the food bank and get that and then distribute it because 
uh, I think as Rita mentioned, a lot of folks uh, who are um, food insecure don't have transportation. So we're getting them to those food, uh, food uh, pantries where they can go pick things up and, and uh, be able to uh, be able to get that and take it back to their space. Uh, you know, a couple of COVID things, um, you know, we kind of talk about food bank almost now pre and post COVID. Um, there were things that we've had to do. Um, we've increased our service and volume to the agencies, as we talked about, you know, a lot of, um, like I say, I'm, I think every one of those agencies that St. Peace supports um, that Mary mentioned is, you know, a food bank client. We distribute food to them. We've been giving them more food um, and increased all our, our volume. Um, we didn't used to really have a model like the picture that Mary, or sorry, that Rita showed where, you know, it was sort of the drive through. We have actually now have, have two, um, each week we have two drive through, uh, which is what, what we, send out is what we call the emergency food box um, and it's kind of a new pro that we put together um, and we're able to have some food staples that we put in the food box and then people can come through and get that and we're usually able to to uh, use that with one of our other programs that's funded um, which is a fresh produce program so people can come up and do uh, the, get their fresh produce as well as their box of emergency foods um, and the supplemental boxes and we've had emergency produce bags that have come together too you saw that picture i think that rita had of people picking out produce we to like to do that that we put it on and like give people the opportunity to come in and be able to pick what they wanted unfortunately because of covid we haven't been able to do that so what we've been doing is being able to bag everything so we have volunteers come in and bag you know four potatoes two apples three carrots in a bag and put it together and then they can just kind of take that um and move it which has been great so we so not only have we we done all these new things but we've also contributed continued with all the other regular distributions that we've had um you know i think the interesting thing a couple other mentioned it is you know, the number of first-time clients that we've seen, uh, people that have not come into the food bank before. So those are some of the things we're doing. You know, I, again, um, I, I do want to say thank you. One of, the th one of the things that I think is really interesting, uh, Rita talked about kids. One of the, the concerns I have most recently that I heard is uh, we provide a lot of food to some of the food banks in the local schools, um, as well as all the free and reduced lunch programs that were in all the schools uh, because kids weren't in school. Uh, we had an opportunity to sort of figure out how we could get food and it was sort of a take and go. Um, kids were, were in the summer, they had different hours, so they were able to come and do that. Once kids went back to school and then were kind of online learning, the number of students that were able to come in or families that were able to come in and pick up those meals every day decreased by like 80%. It was the first couple of weeks was very scary because uh, it makes me wonder where those kids are getting fed. So the districts are all working and thinking about alternative ways that they can do that. But I think there's a problem we can and, and have worked on a solution. But those are all the new kinds of things we're thinking about as all, all of these decisions and things that happen um, impact food insecure people in a very different way that sometimes you might not think about, um, you know, and things like schooling changes uh, definitely, definitely makes a big impact. So um, again, I just want to say thank you. I know, you know, we've helped in the past. Um, if you are so inclined, uh, Rita talked about putting her um, envelope out, you can easily donate and I'll put the, put the, the, we make it very easy at the food bank if you want to donate. We put a um, have a little button on there for you to go through um, uh, to donate if you want to. And like I say, um, significant portion of that will go directly to uh, getting uh, food in front of, of people. But there are many other different places, as Mary's mentioned too, that St. Perpetua has been so kind enough um, and generous to donate to a number of other spaces. So we appreciate that as well. If anybody is looking for volunteer opportunities, we're still, you know, looking for volunteers to help bag and sort and hand out food. I know a lot of people don't feel comfortable doing that um, in this time and totally understand that. We've had to, you know, change that whole process as well. Um, you know, move everybody when we used to have kind of almost an assembly line of people putting together boxes and things. We've moved people far apart and, um, you know, obviously required the face masks and all that kind of stuff. But there are still opportunities of, for volunteers as well. If people are interested, those are on our website as well. One of the things I think is interesting though, I think Mary, you mentioned um, uh, that some of the activities that we've had, fundraising activities got canceled. That was a big issue for the food bank as well. Um, but I do have to say one of the things that was very encouraging to me is the response with COVID from our community. Um, we are serving significantly more people 
but we also saw a significant increase in not only our donations, but in our volunteers, um, particularly when, you know, uh, a lot of people weren't doing a lot of other things. We actually had to turn volunteers away at one point. I think it's, it's slowing down a little bit. We're still looking for them, but um, the generosity of our community uh, was really inspiring. And so, you know, I, I do think that's a, uh, talking about, you know, how God is working his graces and these uh, challenging times, it's a really positive thing to be able to see in our community as well. So we do definitely appreciate that and are, are grateful for all that everybody's done. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up so people can uh, get on with their evening. I will throw, if people are interested, I will throw the uh, website um, if you want to read more about what we're doing um, at the food bank um, into the chat there. So you have it as well. It's super easy. It's food bank CCS, which is Contra Costa Solano. Dot org. So thank you for the time and thank you again. For could, all I, could I ask a question? You certainly can. And this, whether Mary answers this or you do either way, you know, because I was noticing, you know, you're, you're pushing unsweetened cereal. As someone who at one point had a diabetic in the family, I would encourage people to read the carb level on the cereals that they buy and, um, and do your best to make it a lower carb alternative because if people are coming who already are challenged with obesity and perhaps are pre-diabetic and not even know it, that, that might be a helpful thing. And I wanted to know if hot cereal is an option like oatmeal? They have, but it would be the unsweetened oatmeal, yes. Well, of course, yes. No, but yes. It's, it's okay. It doesn't just have to be cold cereal. Because there's yes. more nutrition in oatmeal than there is in a ton of other things that are out there, so. Okay. I, yes. I want to thank Rita, Mary, and Mark. Really appreciate your time and putting all this information together. Uh, as you all see, the need is huge, and it's unfortunately not getting any better soon. So if you are in a, in a, able to help in any which way, um, uh, please do information is in the chat. Uh, if you can't save the chat, um, you can always contact the office and I can point you in the right direction. Uh, next week, uh, next town hall meeting will be with Dr. Fred Piazza. He's a therapist and counselor and in his clinical practice, he's been dealing a lot with stress and that the people are experienced during this uh, crazy pandemic time. So his topic will be maintaining good health, mental health during a very difficult time. Um, so that'll be next week, next Wednesday. And uh, if you want to join us again, please do. Uh, once again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Be safe, be healthy, be well, and uh, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>